uh, I'm really grateful for everybody coming out today. This has been a long struggle for Leonard and all of us. And the one message that we are sending to the government, to the world, to our friends and neighbors, is that the one thing that ain't going to happen, that they want happen, is we'll never give up on Leonard and we'll never forget Leonard. He will not become invisible. This is uh, the organizing of these marches and stuff is hard, but it's a grassroots hard. Each event that we hold is the makeup of what everybody does. Everybody that shows up, everybody that sends a message to their friends, everybody that hands out a flyer. Whatever it is that you do to help, you are an important part of this event. And together, all of you, is what makes up this event. Those that you see speaking here may have certain knowledge, and that's the reason why we speak, but it is you all out there that hear the words today that are the most important people here because you'll take it home with you and maybe give that blessing to your friends and neighbors and others. Uh, we will keep doing this. We will be out uh, here next year. We didn't do it in the winter like we normally do. It seems like more people come out when it's cold as heck. Nevertheless, we're here. And we're here for a very important uh, person and cause and situation. When I speak about Leonard and I speak in solidarity of Leonard, I first always talk about Leonard as a person, and some of the other speakers will get more than that, because Leonard has stood strong for so many years, not just for his own case, but any time uh, a struggle comes up that he hears about, he sees if there's something that he can do for them. He'll issue a statement of support to try to encourage them to go on. He just did that recently with a beautiful statement about I don't know more. He's there for us and we need to be there for him. The other reason is is this is possibly the most important political case in the history of this country. And the reason why I say this is that this situation was not somebody caught in the wrong place at the wrong time or any of these other things that many of our activists do. This was a planned situation. On the Pine Ridge Reservation, they had learned about high-grade uranium in the northwest corner. They wanted that uranium, but they knew because the elders refused to take money uh, for the Black Hills that there's no way that uh, the Lakota people were going to sell that land. So they decided to use other methods, under the table methods, methods that they always keep people of us doing, but we never do what they do. They violated their constitution. They violated the laws of this land. But still it happened. It happened because there were corporations and TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, that wanted that uranium. And they knew that the only way they could get that uranium was to suppress a traditional Lakota people. The traditional Lakota people went through a period of time called the Reign of Terror there. Over 66 people were murdered. Villages were shot up. This was right after Wounded Knee. They went back to Ain, particularly Northwest Ain, and asked for help. Leonard and rest of Northwest Ain went to Pine Ridge and set up an encampment to help them. But not just as you might believe warriors to do. They were doing many other things that warriors do, which is the needs of the people. They started alcohol abuse programs, uh, community gardens. There was talk of a, about a survival school. But they knew that, the FBI knew that they had to not only suppress the traditional people, but with an aim encampment, 
they had to suppress AIM. AIM and organizations like that and struggles like the fishing struggles here, Cascadia, Fort Lawton, and everything, did something very important in this country. It put a spotlight on what's really going on in this land. For many years, most American people uh, didn't even realize the native people even existed anymore and did not understand the terrible conditions, the residential schools and all that, and the ripping off of the land. They talk about financial uh, scandals in the last few years. The biggest financial scandal in the history of this country, and maybe bigger than all the others put together, was the, the Department of Interior handling of native land, of not collecting royalties, of, of stealing land, and, and on and on and on about that. Well, everybody put this big spotlight on it, including AIM, and that's what they needed to suppress. They needed to suppress that spotlight, they needed to suppress the opposition to that uranium, because AIM being around that, that there would be a spotlight on that. That section of the reservation was illegally signed over the day before the so-called shootout at Ogala. How do we know that this was pre-planned. First off, that the illegal signing of a chunk of the Oglala Reservation without the Oglala Tribal Council, without a vote of the people, just by a corrupt uh, tribal chairperson by the name of Dickie Wilson on the day before the shootout. The day before the FBI was out there. They knew what was at that. They went in and talked to them. They knew that it was possible to go in and talk to people at the camp. No problem. But that wasn't good enough. They had stated that they did not want another one to need. They want something over quick. We also know because uh, the local hospitals were told to expect casualties on that day. We also know because all the uh, uh, roads leading into that area were blockaded. So they send in two FBI agents, a police chasing a red pickup truck, which for all the great money that they have to spend on vehicles, apparently they could catch this old reservation pickup truck out on the highway and stop and see who was in it. Uh, rather, they followed it on to the encampment, which they had no warning, uh, uh, warn or anything to go uh, upon. They used it, used the excuse of this red pickup truck that they said that the young boy who had been allegedly accused of stealing a pair of uh, used cowboy boots, and that was their ticket to invade uh, that land on that day. Uh, they came in uh, very fast, came up into a defensive position, just like the drive-by shootings that had been occurring on the Pine Ridge Reservation. The people there believed that they were under um, assault, that they were fighting for their people and their own lives. The firefight did take place. Uh, unfortunately, two FBI agents died. We don't, we, I don't want to feel good about the death of any person, but Leonard's not responsible for the death. If you want to point a finger at somebody, and they're probably in one of these buildings taking pictures of it, it was the FBI that was responsible for the death of their own agents. They sent them in to a situation that they knew that those people would defend themselves, started a firefight, and just because they had that old Custer syndrome, thinking that uh, Native people or anybody else can't defend themselves, uh, unfortunately those uh, two people were casualty, but it wasn't the people defending them, their lives that were casualty. Look at it this way. Somebody comes up to rob you with a gun, and you pack that gun away, and somehow it goes off, and that person uh, dies or something. That's self-defense. 
it's that person that pulled the gun on you that's responsible. It was the FBI that was responsible for that day. And don't let anybody uh, kid you about the idea that we're out here supporting uh, cop killers. We're supporting our people. Through the trial, the government broke its own laws. It intimidated the witnesses. We can prove it. They fabricated our ballistics reports. We proved it. We got to the point that we could prove if we, Leonard was given a new trial, that he was completely innocent because we did, in time, disprove everything that the government uh, put on Leonard. And the two brothers that were tried before Leonard were found not guilty for reason of self-defense. Think about it. They weren't, they, they weren't found uh, uh, not guilty in some nice liberal fashion of uh, of humanity, maybe Olympia or something. They were found not guilty in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And a town that we normally would think would, would be basically biased. Well, those people heard the evidence and found Leonard not guilty. Then, I mean, uh, Bob Robin and Neil Butler are not guilty. Then Leonard was extradited. Uh, somehow, illegally, Leonard's trial was taken away from that judge because he allowed self-defense evidence and given to a known racist judge up in South, in North Dakota and Fargo, who did not allow Leonard to put on any evidence of self-defense or anything else. And the last thing to say about that case was Leonard got extradited back to this country when the United States government gave knowingly lying affidavits to the Can to the government of Canada. They had a woman by the name of Merle Poor Bear come out and say she saw Leonard shoot the agent. Merle Poor Bear was not there that day. Matter of fact, Colonel Corbett had been intimidated by the FBI. They were holding her in motel rooms and told her that if she didn't sign those affidavits, that she'd never see her, her children again. When she finally got free and went to Leonard's lawyer, while that trial was going on, she asked to testify about what was going on. The judge heard her testimony before the jury did and said that the jury could not hear her testimony because if she was to be believed, she would shock the conscience of the court. No doubt about it. Since then, we've had judges saying that uh, the government was as responsible as anybody else for what happened. They came out saying that now that they don't know what part Leonard may have played in the situation that day, only that Leonard was there. Considering that the first two guys were found not guilty for reason of self-defense, Leonard has been in prison for 37 years for the act of self-defense. There's no doubt about that. Well, as I said, Leonard is about everything else that goes around him, even in the prison. Leonard went on a hunger strike once and marrying for the conditions of prisoners. He's done so much. And he tells his people to not just look at him, but to aid those in need. When Malia uh, Abu Jamal was sentenced to death, Leonard asked his supporters to stop working on his case and make damn sure that they didn't execute Malia. That's the type of person Leonard Peltier is. He's for the people, he's for the earth. And it's about time we start looking up to people like that instead of what this society looks up at, at this pulp culture that's destroying our world. We have to stand up for uh, our people, stand up for our prisoners, stand up for Mother Earth, and come together here for the well-being of all. Thank you very much.